after they're over, Jade Rabbit started doing, rolled off and started doing his thing. A Chinese, uh, a Chinese communist flag popped up. And it was a very, and my interesting question was, what does that mean? Now they haven't said they haven't said what that flag means, and I don't think they have a law like we do in the U.S. about not claiming sovereignty. So, in a sense, just like the South China Sea, maybe this is the first step in actually, you know, establishing a narrative of actual claiming sovereignty. You have two competing interests. You know, they're you're going to have the you're going to have the Western side based on the Artemis Accords, which is going to build on the Outer Space Treaty. You have the International Lunar Research Station, which is being spearheaded by the PRC. And this is where this is basically where you're going to get who, who's going to make the rules on the moon and in outer space. Antarctica was the model for the Outer Space Treaty. The Antarctic Treaty was the model for the Outer Space Treaty. So people always compare outer space to, to the maritime domain. Well, that's not true. The true analog is Antarctica. Welcome back to our channel. Today, we delve into the fascinating realm of space exploration and international dynamics. We explore the stark contrasts between American and Chinese space programs. We shed light on China's interest in lunar exploration and why the moon holds such paramount significance for the CCP and the PLA. We can't overlook Elon Musk and his ventures into the cosmos. Stay tuned as we discuss who might ultimately shape the rules of the lunar frontier. Welcome to the show. Hi everyone. Today our guest is Michael Listner, who is an attorney, founder and member of Space Law and Policy Solutions. And he's also author and publisher of the Preci newsletter and briefing letter. And today we will talk about, about the space and what China is doing here. Like, is there, is there a conflict imminent with the U.S.? Could you tell us a little bit about the differences between the American and Chinese space exploration? Well, it's more or less not so much difference between space exploration as much as the, the way their, um, their space programs are organized. In the U.S., we have basically three different sectors. We have national security, we have civil space, which has NASA, and we have this area called non-governmental uh, space program, which is basically commercial, like SpaceX, Blue Origin, etc. The PRC, on the other hand, is is the CCP, is a communist regime, state-owned, and basically the, the People's Liberation Army is the actual has all its fingers in the space program. So there is this thing called the Chinese National Space Administration. However, the PLA has a lot of influence and control over that organization. But but I think that both attitudes is totally different because the, the goals and the purposes for the American and the, and the Chinese exploration are different, even if we now differentiate between governmental and private. In China, even if it's a private company, they still all yes. allegiance to the government, right? So they are not really... They, they still have ownership. Government. They're still owned by part... They're partially owned by the government. Yes, and they, they're not independent That's let's say, SpaceX. So in a way, no matter who, it's always the Chinese... Is it private or governmental? It's always, in the end, the Chinese government that it's exploring space and doing whatever they do. Correct. And behind it, there is always the military component, yes? Yes, correct. Good. So, uh, w what's now the conflict? Let's say in conquering the moon. Like, how? Why is it different from the Chinese and the American side? Well, that's that 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 is that has a political uh, question, and it's also a cultural question. China has a deep, deep history, and in thousands, of, actually thousands of years, as opposed, say, to the U.S., which it measures its its history in hundreds of years. Chinese have a lot of culture surrounding the moon, outer space, what have you. We talked about the Jade Rabbit, um, Shengi, the, the probes that are up there. These are all cultural, mythical figures in their culture, and they inculcate that, that culture into their space programs. However, one of the biggest underlying, the underlying theme is, you know, basically who's going to make the rules. Now, we have, a, there's a body of international space law, and that's been around for about, going on 60 years now. Now, the Chinese kind of got a late start. We have this thing called the Outer Space Treaty that was introduced in 1967. The Chinese actually didn't, the PRC itself didn't come on board until about 1983, where they actually acceded to it. 
And uh, interestingly, Taiwan was one of the original founders of the Outer Space Treaty, but they got they got kicked out of it after after UN Resolution two seven five eight came down uh, because they were no longer considered a sovereign nation after that resolution. So basically, what the 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 dichotomy between the West uh, the Western culture and Western view of international law and and China is they have they have an idea of what the rules should be and as opposed to what the US and the Western world has an idea of what the rules should be. And that's really what's underlying this whole thing of space exploration, exploitation. They want to, they want to change the rules to reflect their worldview as opposed to the worldview of the US and the West. I, I watched your other interviews and uh, I think you drew a parallel between the South China Sea and the space. Mm-hmm. So it, it mm-hmm. looks like the Chinese, the purpose is kind of denying access to others, being first, uh, establishing their own rules and and denying. The, why is this so important to deny other countries, especially the U.S., access to the moon and to the space? What's in it for no. the Chinese? Well, if you want, if you want to make, if you want to make an analogy from gamemanship, you have people talk. Well, this, you know, geopolitics is a big chess game. Well, for maybe for the U.S. and the Russians, it's chess game, but for for the Chinese, the PRC in particular, it's game of Go, and Go is about acquiring territory to gain territory, but also to acquire ter- territory to deny territory. That's what's happening there right now in the South China Sea. They're actually. At the same time, they are trying to acquire sovereignty in these otherwise international areas, while at the same time trying to deny the area to 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 other nations and other states. In order, they want to create the rules. I've always called, you know, I've always looked at the South China Sea. What's happening there as a dry run for outer space and the moon. Case in point, um, back in 1950s, before Sputnik was orbit, the the Russian the Soviets had this idea that they they owned all the territory up from the bottom of the ground all the way up into outer space. In other words, they national they said we can nationalize outer space. When they launched Sputnik, that actually that that whole idea got blown out of the water because it was it was basically violating their own idea. Now, what what China is doing right now through academia, what we call lawfare, they're planning the ideas and the narratives that we own all we own all the way up from the ground all the way up to the territory about into space above our territory. So, in other words, they're going back to what the Soviets originally cast and try and reframe international law into into that segment. So, you gotta understand, lawfare with, with, with the PRC, it we it isn't very it isn't measured in, in terms of years or decades. It's measured in year in terms of many many decades and even hundreds of years. They have a very long term vision and they're very very patient about the strategy. Okay, but uh, in the South China Sea, they are using their, let's say, made-up historical claims. Like, but but they couldn't do this in the space, or maybe there are some folk tales or something they could use. Like, how can they, how can they copy their system with regard to space? Oh, sure, they they they, they, they can use their culture. They 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 have a lot of mythical, a lot of myths regarding the moon. Moon goddesses like Shangyi, which they named some of their probes after. We're familiar with the with the um, the rover U2, the Jade Rabbit. That's another mythical character up related to the moon. All these things are intertwining and using in terms of what we call the three warfares and actually creating this narrative that this is their histor this is historical historically belongs to them and they're just claim they're just reclaiming what was rightfully theirs. And they and they do this again through media Things like TikTok, they're 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 changing the narrative, changing the rules, and by that, gain you know gaining sovereignty as they go along, or attempting to gain sovereignty as they go along. Okay, so now when we let's say let's stay with the symbols. So what's the difference if the U.S. plants a flag on the moon and China plants a flag on the moon? So is it the same or not? No, it's different. Um, back after Apollo eleven. NASA was passing an authorization act, and they were very concerned about the planning of the flag because that wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't part of the mission plan. That was kind of an afterthought. We're going to bring a flag up there, and we're going to put it on the moon. So NASA was very – Congress was concerned because we just signed the Outer Space Treaty a few years ago, and what the treaty says right off is no, no, no state, no nation can claim sovereignty over the celestial body or space. And what does what is planning a flag usually mean? I'm claiming territory in the name of my state. Uh, we saw that in discovery phase here, here in the in, in the new world, with many countries coming and claiming sovereignty by planting a flag or a plaque, what have you. So, as part of the NASA Authorization Act between Apollo 11 and Apollo 12, they put in this little provision that basically says that the implanting of 
the U.S. flag on the moon or another celestial body is not a claim of sovereignty, but rather an expression of national pride and achievement. So that is federal law. Let's go back to what to what uh, I think it was the the Shangi that actually carried the U two rover, rover. After the rover, Jade Rabbit started doing rolled off and started doing his thing. A Chinese uh, a Chinese communist flag popped up, and it was a very uh, man. And my interesting question was, what does that mean? Now they haven't said they haven't said what that flag means, and I don't think they have a law like we do in the U.S. about not claiming sovereignty. So, in a sense, just like the South China Sea, maybe this is a first step in actually, you know, establishing a narrative of actual claiming sovereignty. I don't know. I mean, I can't I can't say that's a for a fact, but at the same time, I can't dismiss that that possibility. Dear viewers, help us overcome algorithm suppression by liking, commenting and sharing this important content. Especially since we talk to world's top experts. I think both countries, the US and uh, China, are trying to build some coalitions, which, which means they, they try to find allies who can support them. I guess the financing or the scientific part would be on, on, on China, but they want to find allies who maybe know where they can build bases or, you know, um, mm -hmm. Like, like we have in Argentina. So, so let's talk about the, the the coalitions first. Who who does China, where does China look for support? Who they want? To, who do they want to ally with? Well, they're ally they're allying with with states that actually share their worldview. Um, the Russian Federation was one of the first ones that came on, um, and actually they just ratified actually ratified with what's called the International Lunar Research Station, and countries like Pakistan, I believe Venezuela. And a few others. I think there's ten in all. The most recent being Turkey, which 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 is surprising because it's actually a NATO uh, a NATO country um, signed on to this. So they have about ten they have about ten states, but they also have non governmental organizations like 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 institutions and uh, scientific foundations that have actually signed on as well. It doesn't have the same stature as a state signing on, but you know it it, ga it gains it, it's a way for them to gain prestige in that matter. Now, compare that to the U.S. effort called the Artemis Accords, which was started by, under President Trump. Basically, it you know we we've gathered a, a lot of they've got a lot of their members. I think I think right now the count is thirty four as of just the other day because Slovenia was the latest one to join. And so basically, what what you have here is you have two competing interests. And, you know, they're going to have the you're going to have the Western side based on the Artemis Accords, which is going to build on the Outer Space Treaty. You have the International Lunar Research Station, which is being spearheaded by the PRC. And this is where this is basically where you're going to get who, who's going to make the rules on the moon and in outer space. And uh, again, just by looking at what what states are, are signing up with which side, you can you can kind of see a dichotomy of where they, you know, where they want to go in terms of what what the rule of law looks like in outer space. Yeah, if we draw a parallel again, maybe let's say to the submarines or the Navy, it looks like China is kind of on the winning side because they both have the money, the commitment, they have the, the, the infrastructure. So it looks like it might it might be now in their favor. But we have, you know, sometimes they even do lose. Now with the new Argentinian president, uh, I think they, they just had a setback with their with with the observation station. Could you could mm -hmm. you maybe talk a little bit about that? I think I think the big bellwether in that with Argentina was last year. Argentina signed on to the Armistice Accords, which was shocking. Um, and when I when I, when I saw it, because of you know Beijing's influence in here, now with with this with, with the new president in there and and the more scrutiny over the, the this super secret station that they're not letting anybody into their, their political power there seems to be waning a little bit. I mean, make no mistake. It's a very strategic, that is a very, what that station is very strategic. We don't know what, what it's fully used for, but I mean, it does give them ability to not only, you know, track their own spacecraft, but also track other spacecraft targeting for, you know, counter space capabilities, what have you. It's a significant capability. How this is going to play out in over the next uh, few years with, with the new president and a new attitude, I suppose, especially with joining the Artemis Accords here in the U.S., um, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, but it is definitely something to watch because South America is turning into a hotbed for outer space, and both the PRC and the the U.S. are really competing to gain 
uh, prestige and influence in, in that region. Yeah, and also it's not only the president. Recently, the commander of the U.S. Southern Command, Laura Richardson, mm-hmm. Richardson, she visited Argentina. She had a connection with the with the president, right? And her remarks upset the Chinese very much, right? So it's it seems like it's at least one place where the U.S. has the upper hand. And also, I think Argentina is going to buy some U.S. jets. So it looks like they are turning mm-hmm. pro pro American. Yeah, it's. With geopolitics, it's always a tightrope. You know, things you, you may look like you had, you know, your things are going one way. However, they could go the other way really quickly. Um, anything could change it. I am I'm enthusiastic about the influence. You know, that Argentina seemed to turning away from the PRC, but you know, elections have consequences, and down the road, this president could get voted out, and it could go the other way. It's very hard to say, but I'm very heartened to see that there is some scrutiny about that station that the U.S. is, you know, spending a lot of time and, and uh, paying a lot of attention to Argentina in particular, given, given, and especially since it's so close to Ant- Antarctica as well. Studio Asia is an independent channel. I am neither looking for sponsors nor asking you for donations. I value much more your comment under this interview. It means a lot to me, a lot. Subscribing and sharing helps me to be promoted by YouTube. I will appreciate it very, very much. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Um, I wanted to mention those Antarctica stations that come handy because they, I, I think they're very useful in terms of the fractional orbital bo- bombardment systems, which can deliver nuclear weapons. So maybe you could talk about that because that is also connected to Argentina, right? It may be. It, it may be. I'm not... I. My technical knowledge of how FOBs work or how the, the PRC's FOB system works is limited, but I will say that it does, that that station does you know give give a point of observation you know for tracking in, in terms of tracking maybe developing uh, pathways or routes for you know for for these types of systems. I don't think you see any of those in Antarctica because that's that would definitely you know. Make some very people very angry because supposed because believe it or not, Antarctica was the model for the Outer Space Treaty. The Antarctic Treaty was the model for the Outer Space Treaty. So people always compare outer space to to the maritime domain. Well, that's not true. The true analog is Antarctica. So you have this sovereignless region for the most part. That again, the PRC is in there, and they're trying. And in my opinion, trying to gain a foothold to actually claim some sovereignty as well. So another, it's another very interesting area to watch. And it seems like the West, again, is behind because because the only one actually trying to fight China on that is the US. I mean, the EU is absolutely out of out of the picture, I guess. They, they, abs- they have nothing to, to contribute. So it's only think, the US standing between us and China conquering the space, right? I would, I think that, I think that's accurate. I mean, my concern is right now about getting getting people back on the moon because the first part, the first state that gets people back on the moon is the one who's going to get uh, break the narrative or make the rules. Here, here's here's my concern. We're we're all concerned here in the U.S. about this thing called TikTok that is basically has roots in the Chinese Communist Party in the, in their government, and it's highly influential, especially among the young, younger generation. If the, the the PRC gets their taikonauts on the moon before the U.S. does. They can get a foothold there, and they can start a narrative about you know how how China was always there, you know always there, and the U.S. never got there. Now, in other words, they could they have they have an opportunity through social media and other propaganda means to actually rewrite history. And unfortunately, I think it's so influential this generation with a lot of these people have actually walked on the moon, you know, passing on would believe that oh the U.S. never made it to the moon. The Chinese have always been there. So it's an opportunity for them to rewrite history. And that's one of the reasons, aside from writing the rules, that it's important to get back to the moon. But is the U.S. standing in between China and, you know, China and outer space? Possibly. I, th- I think that's probably a decent analogy. But there's some, there's more than just, you know, hardware. There's also the legal aspect of it, law, law, what we call lawfare, influencing the actual shape and form of international law. That's the real battle that's going on. Okay, but I still have to say it's, it seems like we all do have to catch up with the reality because we always talk about the South China Sea, Taiwan, the Philippines, but it looks again like China is ahead of us. I mean, then there is still yet another topic where we might have a conflict with them. 
So it seems like the space is a priority for them, but not yet for us. Am I correct? It it is in the sense that we have different systems of government. They have a basically the a, the party that is basically a totalitarian regime. We have a, we're a republic that has a democratic system. So every four years, we we have we have a change. We, we have a presidential election, and sometimes we have a change of presidency. Every two years, we have an election to change our House of Representatives, and every six years, we have we reelect you know some senators. So the shape of Congress changes every two years, and with that priorities change. Now, Congress in particular is very important because they draw, they basically provide the funds. The executive branch also sets policy and they, they, they can change every, every time a new president comes in or a new administration comes in, they can, they can change their policy. So a, a president can serve for eight term for, for two terms, eight years maximum. So in an eight year, in eight year span, a president can, can set a policy, but his, his or his successor can come in and decide, I have a totally different idea how we want to go and change that policy. It's different in the PRC because they have these things called, five, they have five-year plans, basically. They put out these white papers saying, this is basically what we're going to do for the next five years, and they, and they stick to it. And if it works, after the next five years, they, they continue on. So again, they think more long-term because, because of their form of government is, is, less, is not democratic like ours. They have that advantage. But again, it's a drawback. And I guess I wouldn't say a drawback. It's one of the prices we have to pay for having a democratic society. You mentioned that when the Chinese get on the moon, they might change uh, the narrative. What else is in it for them? Like, let's say in practical terms, they start landing, you know, bringing people to the moon. What can they do there? What, what, how can they win the game? Space resources. Uh, back in 2015, the U.S. passed a law, U.S. Congress passed a law and it was, that basically created this right for space resources. And it was, a, it was a huge, huge issue and still a huge issue right now about the legality of it. Now, the Russians are just totally against it. They don't like it. They're belligerent about it and they don't like it. But the Chinese have been pretty, pretty clever about it. Um, they, they haven't really been, they haven't really denounced it. But what, the, what they said, what, but basically they just came out and said, we're going to, we're, we're going to support the idea and, and have, and, and help develop it moving forward. So this idea of space resources is, is that a private citizen can actually go to, can go to the moon or a comet or an asteroid, harvest the minerals, whether it be regular water or actual metals, and they can possess them and actually sell them for profit. Now, here's the issue, here's the issue with, 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 China, with, with China and commercial space. Because of commercial space, those, those companies are still partially owned by the, by the Chinese government. In other words, Beijing has a big stake in it. So when they go to the moon or the celestial bodies and perform a space resource activity, it isn't really an ind- it isn't a private citizen that's a private company or a citizen that's doing it. It's actually the government. So in a sense, they're violating that non-sovereignty principle uh, in the Outer Space Treaty. And in a, se- in a sense, they could be changing international space law in that manner just by performing those activities. So in the case of the U.S., we presented this law. We sat on it for a long time. Uh, the Trump administration actually, you know, bolstered it again. But the Chinese have been watching it, and they're taking advantage of our own idea, in my opinion. And I think they're going to, you know, they're going to beat us at our own game with that if we don't, you know, progress more with this. Let's say you are in power now. What would you do to to cope to deal with the Chinese influence? What would you do to bring the U.S. ahead of China? One, I start a sip. I would start a systematic, have a strategic plan developed for. Lawfare and hybrid warfare. That's one area we really, really lack in. Um, there's, there's this doctrine called the three warfares that the Chinese Central Committee actually told the PLA, we want you to use this. And basically, you, you use the law, you use the media, and you use psychology to actually change narratives and reach political objectives instead of using actual physical force. So that, that has been very effective. It's been around for about, for about 20 years now, and they've been doing it very effectively. Here in the U.S., we recognize it, but we're afraid of it. There was there was actually a legal conference, U.S. Spacecom legal conference, back in March, and there was actually a panel on lawfare and the PRC, and there was a representative from DOD there, and they they were they were they were really really I would say petrified of the idea of lawfare, and this representative from the Office of Secretary of Defense just came out and said, "We're not going to do lawfare," and I was sitting on the other side of the screen, very stunned, saying. 
but you you know we have more lawyers than anybody else. We can beat them at their we, we can beat them at their own game. So the first thing I do, I was a sit down and tell. I, I would basically say, I want a comprehensive strategy for lawfare, lawfare, media warfare, psychological warfare, to not only counter theirs but actually use it offensively to actually go out and win the game and beat them and basically beat them at their own game. That would be my first. That would be my first. I say directive if I, if I was in quote in power. Okay, follow up question to that. What do you think about people like Elon Musk? Can we leverage him, or can rather China leverage him with all his businesses and exposure to, to their market? That's a good. That is a good question. Um, no, nobody knows what's going on inside the Elon Musk mind except Elon Musk. I think he's a very val. I think he's a valuable strategic uh, person in terms of what he's done with SpaceX and the other technology that he's been um, promoting here. I think he has some vulnerabilities with his dealings with with, with uh, the PRC in particular. I know Taiwan was very very upset, was very concerned about him. There was an instant where where Taiwan was actually negotiating with him to actually use Starlink for for national defense, and they were ve- they were very concerned with his connections with Beijing and Tesla. They made the the idea is they want they wanted to basically say, well, we want to own fifty one percent of Starlink in order for you to use it, and. He said no, and the whole deal fell apart. And I guess now OneWeb is going to be doing it. So I think I think I think there is concern about you know his his relationship with China. I think he may and maybe in his mind thinks maybe he can stay stay two two or three steps ahead of them. But again, you know, don't you know you can't underestimate the PRC um, and their government organs like the like the MSS, their security services. They're very clever. They're very resourceful. And if they get, if they really get, if they really get a hook into you, it's going to be hard to get out of it. So, I think I think he needs to be careful. I mean, I'm not I'm not his advisor, I'm not his lawyer, but you know, I think he needs to watch watch and be careful and know who he's dealing with because, again, he is valuable. He is valuable here because of SpaceX and Starlink and everything else, but he can be equally valuable to them and you know, for for other things as well. What are you going to research twenty four twenty five? What should be, we be looking for? Right now, I am working on a paper that I'm hopefully going to submit by the end of the week, um, dealing with Taiwan satellites. Um, Taiwan is in a, in a really interesting position with with its satellites because it's not a member. It's not a member of the other uh, of the international legal community anymore. It's it's a non state under the way the UN sees it. So basically those satellites up there, they can't, you know, the, the idea is they really can't own them like, like the U S can. So case in point, the U S launches a satellite and that satellite they own in perpetuity, kind of like the maritime principle of federal warships. They, they're owned in perpetuity unless you abandon them because Taiwan is not no longer a member of the outer space treaty and can't have, can't assert standing under customary international law. They can't do that. Now it's interesting because in we have this thing called the Register of Space Objects. It's listed in the register as pro, for Taiwan Province of China. So it has a very interesting conundrum about what does that really mean. And my, the focus of my paper is, you know, this is a potential lawfare von, vulnerability to their satellites, and how the U.S. could actually step in and potentially make a law mover of its own to actually, you know. Snag them away, snag them away from that limbo, that legal limbo they're they're in, and actually give them some sort of legal protection under the U.S. Okay, so, yeah, that sounds interesting. Yeah, it's 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 a pretty interesting paper. Uh, hopefully, I'll get it submitted to uh, Texas Journal of International uh, National Security Law by the end of the week. So we'll see. Great, thank you very much for your time and for your insights. It was a pleasure. Likewise, thank you very much for having me. I have so many other explosive interviews on this and similar topics. Please check out my channel.